All right, so welcome to uh, Macro to Micro Power Hour. I am Samantha Leduc, founder of Leduc Trading. Basically, this is something where I wanted to invite um, a subject matter expert because of the recent uh, banking crisis, both here and abroad. And Jeffrey and I've had a lot of conversations via DM on Twitter. Twitter is a wonderful exchange for information. So I wanted to bring him in so we could better uh, understand the crisis at hand. Okay, so uh, Craig is on holiday this week. We wanted to run a macro to micro power hour. And I thought, who better to invite than someone with whom I've been conversing on FinTwit um, at length the past few weeks. We have a banking crisis here and abroad, and he's got some kind of uh, granular detail, historical precedents, um, but I also think uh, a unique perspective. So I wanted to introduce him. Um, and thank you, Jeffrey, very much for uh, for popping in here because it was a little bit of, you know, we're doing so much of this back and forth. I just said, listen, I, I want to do this live. So uh, Jeffrey um, is actually currently CEO of DocuTalk, which is a New York-based uh, software company and a very cool software at that. In fact, I saw his bio, went and checked out the software. He saw that I was online. We started talking. So um, I'll let him talk a little bit about that later on. This is um, important. I think we get to kind of the kernel of the corn, which is his interpretation of what's going on with this bank bailout. And then scoping that, I also have some fabulous clients who are bank experts who I've invited to attend and some macro uh, interested uh, players, obviously. So I want to open it up and allow enough time for them to do um, uh, Q&A as well. So Jeffrey, the, the short bio of you know where you come from and then um, why do you think the Fed is getting conned? Let's go right to the all right, so um, I come from risk arbitrage. Uh, I used to work in the uh, in, in New York in the risk arbitrage special situation. Back in the uh, crisis of 2008, I managed to make money. I think it was basically mainly by gut and uh, and uh, flair and more than understanding. So I locked myself for three years uh, uh, reading about precedents to understand a bit why I was uh, I got lucky. Uh, and back in 2014, I figured this is no, this is a, this is not the right uh, environment. I want to do something else, and I started to work in uh, different things, and I uh, built this uh, augmented media uh, format of uh, of communicating that I will discuss later, as you mentioned. So now, if you allow me, I will uh, share my screen and share what I found out by reading very old books and finding the trail on one to the other author that are not taught anymore, unfortunately, in, uh, in, uh, in, in finance anymore. This is really a, a pity. So let me try to share my screen. I think I need to have uh, share screening, uh, sharing screen abilities. Yep, you're there. All right, so I'm gonna share this screen. Uh, all right, so let's go. Let's do this. Ah, you, you tagged my tagline. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, I love it. It's, okay. it's a mantra of mine, but yes, it is. It is. All right. So let's uh, let's discuss this topic about the Fed is trap. So first of all, Mr. Griffin said that the intervention in um, um backing the deposit was a mistake is right but not necessarily for the reason the reason he thought uh he was right uh we have a big problem at the fed with, which is called a quasi, quasi fiscal deficit um this is um what's systemic today in banking the fed is systemic and the deposit guarantee will increase the fed big problem what is the big problem this is this chart that a lot of people have seen. They're not too sure what to make about it. And uh, and they you kind of move this stuff. How do I move this thing? Right, stop. All right. They're mo um, monumental losses. Yes. And people say this is loss, but it's not a problem because the bank, it's uh, they don't have to, uh, you know, they don't work like in the regular bank. It is a problem. Uh, but it doesn't work like... Uh, um, uh, a, a, a normal bank. How central bank, a central bank failed. A central bank in redeemable currency fails by uh, inability to redeem. So in 1825, the Bank of England almost failed and had to be bailed out by other central banks. Um, a fiat central bank fails by quasi-fiscal deficit. 
Um, this uh, Richard Koo is one of, of the men I, I really admire. He's been really right on many things, including the problem of reserves that we're going to discuss. Uh, and we're going to talk about what is this thing about a negative remittance. And this is a study from the World Bank, Mr. Rodriguez, in 1993. Paying interest on the monetary base, that's what the uh, reverse repo is, uh, or making central bank debt accessible to commercial banks may seem to be a good idea to increase the absorption of liquidity in the short run. The short run impact of printing money can be sterilized. So it's a sterilization problem, um, a program by imposing a higher remunerated reserve requirements or inducing banks to acquire other types of central uh, bank debt. Reserve requirements probably should have been used. However, as this operation is repeated, the base for the inflation tax is eroded and any additional deficit financing requires ever increasing rates of sterilization. Let's uh, go into that. Yeah, especially so, sterilization and the reserve requirements. So basically the sterilization is that you have an inflation tax. Okay, everyone knows what it is, but you're returning this tax to some uh, holders, which are the banks. So it, it, essentially, uh, your uh, inflation tax is not as efficient as if you did not return this inflation tax to, to banks. So you have to tax more on inflation because of that. Okay. And this can turn into um, a snowball. Why it can turn into a snowball? Because you're actually sending liquidity to banks by trying to stop them, their velocity. You understand what I'm saying? It's a self-defeating situation. That you raise rates, but you have to pay banks to prevent them to use the money. But, but velocity right now is on the ground. Not really. I will show you that. Not okay. really. Uh, so essentially what you do is self-defeating. Say, hey, I'm going to pay the banks so they don't use. But by doing that, you're actually sending them liquidity. So you send them liquidity to stop velocity. This is this stuff is how you get into hyperinflation in Latin, uh, in Latin America case. All right. I don't know. If, was it clear? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, if not, they'll they'll ask. But yes, All I understand. Right. So now the question of this, oh, uh, the banks currently awash with liquidity, especially since Sunday evening, velocity on the ground. What's the risk and what's the reward? What are they hoping will come out of this? And what are the chances of real risk cascading? We're going to come to the, the velocity. Uh, in, in I'm second. anxious. <laughs> All right. Now, why the deposit guarantee makes that worse? Because it increases the quasi-fiscal deficit. This cost that you have to pay. That's why you have the negative. What I'm trying to say is this negative can cut on more and more and more and more negative while sending more and more liquidity to the banks. That's how a central bank in fiat fails. That's how you get to hyperinflation. Because you're sending to stop velocity, you're actually sending them liquidity. You're sending them payment on M0. Now you say, uh, and this uh, deposit guarantee makes it worse because a bad loan granted by the central bank and financed by its bond is the same as a bad loan granted by a commercial bank and funded with a central bank guaranteed private time deposit. Okay. So essentially what they have done is they say, hey, this is the cost, the deposit, uh, we're going to fund the bad loans with our deposit. Ah, but now this is the central bank, which is uh, going to fund the bad loans uh, with he, its balance sheet. You understand the, the logic of this paper from uh, Rodriguez? So that's why it can increase this uh, quasi-deficit cost. All right. So people say, yeah, but it never happened in the US. You can compare to Latin. Well, it's untrue. The, uh, confeder the confederacy dollar, the monet uh, monetary authority was paying interest on M0. Just to stop people, so you imagine the confederacy, there is, you know, they issue uh, the confederate dollar like crazy, and they don't want people to use it too fast. So they pay interest to try to retain so that people hold. It's a lack of demand on M0. 
That's why it's sterilization. That is a bribe so that people don't dump the currency and uh, it gets into the economy too fast. Does it make more sense now? It's basically you issue a lot of paper, Confederate paper, and people don't want it to say, hey, the prices are rising. I'm not going to keep that stuff. I have a negative demand for uh, money. I, I don't want to hoard it. Let's dump it and buy stuff like in Weimar. Deflationary. No, no, no. It's After very inflation. inflation hyperinflationary peak. Yeah, like yeah, because basically what, what people have no demand for money. You dump them. Mrs. explains that. It's a negative demand for money. People have to get the money. As soon as they get it, they say, buy something, buy something. I want to sell the money for something. I want to dump the money to buy anything because I don't want to keep it because I'm not sure that's going to keep it as much as thing power. So in the order ultimate, to- The ultimate things over paper thesis. Yeah, so basically to keep people from doing that, uh, the Confederacy was paying interest on M0, which is not supposed to do, to try to get to people say, let's not dump the money, let's not buy stuff, let's not go too fast in the end velocity. So they pay interest. That's why a quasi-fiscal deficit is it's very serious. So what is the cause of uh, fiscal deficit? What is the root cause? It's the overextension of M0, so basically of the uh, central bank, is buying assets which are non-qualifying for central banking. So basically they're putting crap on the central bank asset, on uh, the balance sheet. So this what's I the, understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then they issue money for stuff which is not supposed to be uh, qualified for, uh, for assets. So Henry Thornton is the father of central banking, according to the Fed. It was praised by the Keynesian and Austrian. And Bagahoe is basically a, a copycat. It's not bad, but how Thornton is so great that it, it, it's, it's a, a, the comparison is not so, so advantageous. So what he said is that you should have in your central bank good bills, government bonds, you can do it, but you have to be able to tell the, 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 the government, hey, at some point you have to pay me. That's really true independence. Whereas the continental central banks at the time in the late uh, 18th century were using the currency as financing. No, in the UK, the central bank could say, government, pay me my gold. And that's very different. So you have good assets, which are self-liquidating short-term, whereas John Law was putting equities in the Mississippi, you were doing a debt swap for Mississippi shares which is completely not qualifying for something which is quasi the uh, money. So good bills, they convert into money, they self-liquidate. By 90 days, you get the gold, it's back to money. So it's, it's, it's fine. It's a good asset for central banking. Mm -hmm. Now, the Swiss National Bank has acquired um, stocks. This is the 13F of the Swiss National Bank. So we're mm -hmm. back to John Lowe's central banking, ridiculous. Bankrupt central banking. Now, what should qualify? Thornton said, as I said, self-liquidating assets and Kemmerer, which was who was a, a Princeton professor and did a lot of uh, debt restructuring at the time, said same thing. Preference should be shown for short-term loan of self-liquidating character, as originally contemplated by the Federal Reserve System. The Fed was not supposed to hold government debt by its foundation. Well, they broke that long ago. Yeah. So the quick back one, two slides in regards to the SNB, since they have a large amount of holdings that are US equities concentrated in uh, tech and energy. And last year, 2022, they took a very large hit, $162 billion in losses because of that risk parity uh, breakdown and NASDAQ um, underperformance. Um, you're going to talk more about the Swiss National yeah, Bank. Yeah, this is not okay, a good. bank. It, 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 we're gonna, it's not a bank. Uh, so why do we have, why is, not, why is the Fed not following the principle that they say they, they, they admire, some not admit, admire? Okay. Uh, why do they do that? Because we are in a war currency regime. So what, what are you talking about? Okay. 1793-1823, Napoleonic War, suspension of conversion. Fiat, just like to, uh, today. We return to species. Civil War, Thunder War, return 1861-1865, goes Fiat, return to species. 
1913, 1920, non-redeemable. It's actually like fiat because there was no, uh, you could not redeem the species. And then we have an imperfect return to species that created the 1929 crisis. Then we have the war, everyone, nobody is redeeming a, a species. And then we do an imperfect return to species. And in 71, we return to fiat, okay? Define species for those who are not familiar. It's a convertible currency. It's basically that instead, uh, when you had the bills, the dollar bills, you go there to the counter and say, give me gold or silver. You still have a system which is a bit like that, which is it's redeemable in something else. So people have a, a capacity to say, I, want to, I can impact the quantity of M0 and send it abroad. I have the capacity to influence the interest rates as a private holder of the currency. You can do that in Hong Kong. If you sell to uh, Hong Kong dollars to US dollars, because it's pegged, there's less M0 in the system and you force interest rate rates up, just you, any uh, the lambda person can do that. It's not the central bank who can decide on the rates, it's the public. Okay. Your eyebrows raise. <laughs> yeah. So basically, the power of the so public. Okay. For, for some people, it's very foreign. They say, no, this is transfer bank that you said, no, no, no. Before the natural rate was decided by the market saying, eh, there are too many dollars. Uh, so I, give me my gold. There's too much credit acceleration. Give me my gold. I want to contract the, the M0. The public was doing QT or QE, not the Fed. By coming with their gold and say, give me dollars, they do QE. And they say, yeah, you know what? The prices are too high. You start to, you start to have a trade deficit. It's no good. And you, know, you start to have a discount of, the, of your currency goes below the gold. Give me my gold. And then interest rate go up and prices come back down. So it's a natural uh, uh, auto-regulation by the market who decides What's the quantity of M0? And if uh, prices are too high, I want to pull it out. If there, there's lots of bargains, things are cheap, I want to pull in my, my gold and increase money supply. Very different system. Now, what is the mechanics of war currency and bond stuffing? It's important because we have the same today. Well, you had preferential low discount rates on the wallpaper, so basically government debt, where an additional factor in the deposit and note, note expansion. So basically, using the debt stuffing as collateral, say, oh, banks have a lot of liquidity. Okay. So that's why you have a boom in, uh, in credit. And by maintaining these loans rates and federal rates below the market rates, so that's what he's saying is that the market before the World War I, public decides there's no government debt in the Fed, no government in the Fed, there's just good deals. As the market decides the rates, and now with the discount, artificial low discount on treasure on US paper, the government paper, boom, lots of liquidity. And this rate on government paper is not noble. So it encouraged borrow and buy, war bonds, and made the borrowing, and borrowing that result in rapid expansion of our circulated bank credit, deposit credit, and Federal Reserve notes. So boom, an explosion. You stuff the government paper. In the, uh, in the banking system, and you have an explosion of credit. And he's saying, so I'm going to pass on that because there are lots of details and you are going to receive the presentation. You can see the exact mechanics of how this uh, explosion stuffing below market rates, government debt in the banking system led to uh, you know, bad uh, malinvestment, too much liquidity, and inflation. All right, so there is this, and that you'll be able to read that. Okay, and what he says, this camera, which is professor and did a lot of uh, serving refreshing, uh, the banking system was impaired by the perpetuating highly inflated and unstable circulating media with high prices in order to prop up the market price of GOM of the government bond. Does it sound familiar? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Too familiar. Yeah. Uh, so what he says, the remedy uh, is that uh, there is no question that the real rate is much higher than the camouflage war rate 
to an increasing degree, government, government bonds and certificates must stand upon their own bottoms as investments. In other words, it's saying, remove those from the Fed, from the banking system, and let's see what's the price of, the, of, of that paper. Now, can you imagine that? Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, it'll be 40 to 50 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. But as Thomas Took explained, in the central bank, there is equality, M0, and then there is, well, it's inverted, but you have on the right side, you have the M0 and you have a government bonds, and there's equality. So M0 is going to con converge to the true value of those bonds like via currency depreciation. Okay. Uh, so he says, move it out. Move it out of the banking system because it's creating too much liquidity, malinvestments, and wrong allocation of resources. So what people are being taught in MBA is that the risk-free rate <laughs> is the uh, TSY. It's crap. Sorry about the language. And, uh, but the risk-free rates exist, nonetheless. It does exist. Um, uh, Thomas Took explains that. Uh, so this is the leverage since 1971. This is the total financial assets to GDP. Okay? So it is basically uh, future promise, uh, promises on the future of GDP in terms of bonds and equities. Okay? Discounted to today divided by GDP. So do we have an absurd expansion of financial assets as a result of what I just described of stuffing bonds, government bonds? Of course. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so I put a little bit of, uh, <laughs> people say, ah, we had a little bit of deflation in 2009. That's the only the amount of deflation we had in retail price indexes. Okay. So Jeffrey. I know people, uh, sorry about that. Go ahead. Can you do me one favor? Can you go back one slide? Yeah. I don't have it right in front of me, but I could grab it. This particular chart that is showing total financial assets um, uh, by gross domestic product. I have mm -hmm. a chart of U.S. government debt divided by the 10-year over time. Yeah. It looks just like this. You know, another one is the U.S. stock market, SPX, divided by the 10-year. Looks just like this. The parallels are amazing. That's why I keep going and on my you know Twitter mantra, clients know, but those who follow me don't. US government debt is the stock market. Yeah. It, it looks it just like this. So you have as a result, a result a regime of this is the price index. So we have we don't have deflation. We have swoons in capital markets, yes, but we don't have price deflation. And I show you that this is the, def uh, the inflation deflation rates for 350 years in the US. We have green spikes. After 1933, no green spikes. Why? We move to elastic money. In other words, when there's a contraction of credit, we increase the other mean of circulation, which is M0, because we can. With gold, you can't. All right. So basically, Credit contracts and price really go down, like really green spikes, okay? But with elastic money, the total means of circulation, which include money, credit, and currency, don't contract because at the same time, we push money to prevent uh, the, the credit from contracting. So that's why you don't have any more those green spikes, okay? Okay, SVBs are the consequence. Okay, so now we get into uh, the SVB problem. Modern it's, day, yeah. <laughs> We're all it's pulling it forward from the past. So this is presented as a widespread duration problem with impending uh, widespread loss to be realized by a lot of banks. Okay, now SVB was not a bank. What is the origin of banking? You discount the good bills. So you have a receivable. You go to the bank and they give you a deposit, or you have a loan for a piece of machinery. So you have a loan. They get the lien. On, and they provide a deposit to you with interest and they record a book on their book and they record a loan. Uh, this creates banking relationship and sticky deposit because your deposit is against uh, receivable, right? So it's, it's, uh, you have two sides, right? Now, SVB clients are not bankable. They say, well, but there's a lot of rich people who you say they're not bankable. But they're unprofitable uh, tech. But what, what they do 
they are not eligible for most uh, traditional banking products. Where's the machinery you provide a loan for? Where are the receivables? You are burning cash flow. So all of those as normal assets, credit, good credit banking assets that you have normally, they don't have it. Okay, and at the same time, they permanently leak deposit. And since they don't have this uh, factoring or loans on machinery relationship, they move the deposit. The only uh, real inflows of cash are VC rounds. Okay, so they have no very smart distinction that you made there. Most people do not look at it that way. Very, it's, very, very, very. It's the origin of banking. That. Banking is you have two sides. Here you have one side. And they're not happy with the interest you give them a deposit, they go to the next side. This is not a bank. And they're held hostage. So not only are they, uh, you know, unprofitable tech and biotech, but they can't go anywhere else because it's it, in order to get access to that community and those loans, they have to stay there and deposit there. So there's uh, exactly. also an active so, audience. So if you look at the deposit that grew 61 billion to uh, and tripled in two years, this is not coming from new receivables. This is not coming from new loans for machinery. There's just, okay, they get some huge inflow in, in startups, but there is no those, these two sides. So it's not sticky. Those huge swings in deposit. Mm. Now, so the SVB has a lack of traditional banking assets, the factoring, the machinery financing, or what have you. And because they don't have those normal asset banking assets, but they have the cash, then S, uh, SVB is investing in not the good banking traditional assets. They invest in mortgage-backed securities. And just why, like they are a hedge fund. Mm -hmm, they're a hedge fund. Okay. Uh, so, so conclusion, people say, oh, we have a duration problem that is impending and all the banks are going to have a problem. The first, in the first place, this entity was not a normal bank. You'll know this local bank that provides uh, the, the, their lending services and factoring and uh, all those banking products to the local uh, community. And those clients actually create cash flow. They don't just pull cash flow out. All right. So this is excellent. And a distinction is to be highlighted. Now, jump to a bigger problem. I don't want to interrupt your flow, but Swiss National Bank runs like a hedge fund as well. So well, I think the Swiss National Bank, they have a different problem, which is they have a terrible uh, outflows because uh, they are the sanctions. Okay. Sanctions, they are the uh, some people in the Arab say, hey, I, I'm not, there's no problem between my country and the United States, but uh, look at what happened with the Russian oligarch. Maybe one day someone says, "I smell from the my from the feet," and and they say that uh, I'm sanctioned. So they are moving their money to Singapore. Plus, they are bad decision management decision, poor uh, poor business decision. I'm not an expert on on the Swiss, uh, on uh, you're talking Credit Suisse or the Swiss National Bank. I'm talking about Swiss National Bank with its whole ah, uh, okay, of U.S. Okay. assets and concentration and energy. Uh, no, Swiss National and National Bank. Rates. The Swiss National Bank is really, uh, they think they, they are general law uh, uh, 2.0. So they basically buy assets which do, completely don't qualify for, for central banking. This is a bankruptcy, uh, Richard Koo, bankruptcy of, of uh, central banking, uh, intellectual, intellectual, intellectual bankruptcy of, of uh, central banking. All right, so that's, that's why, coming back to SVB, this is what really happened, okay? Now, you spook people with a chart, with this chart. You've seen this chart in Twitter. Everybody has, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the FDIC chairman, loss could be large, should banks need liquidity? Now, in the context of SVB, you understand that your local, why is your local bank going to have a deposit moving out? And they should have low, a lot more loans, uh, normal loans than than the uh, than SVB. So why where is the leakage on deposit? You create a panic and then then you have the leakage on deposit. All right, but it, um, there is no endogenous leakage in most banks. SVB is very particular. And then they don't talk about that. And that is what um, number one is the credit losses. Blue, 
This is the credit losses that we have in the US banking system. It's very low. And two, this is the coverage. Ratio. Right? Mm -hmm. Coverage ratios. So you have a lot of capital and low, uh, small amount of losses. But can you transform a, 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 de a deposit run into a credit? Potentially. Potentially. But right now, we're not at all in 2008 at all in terms of reserve requirements and credit losses. Why? Because the Fed has created so much reserves. Every time they were buying, it's, oh, reserve, reserve, reserve. They pile up reserve, pile up reserve, pile up reserve. Imagine a, a gold meteorite that falls in 19th century. Everyone is taking the piece of gold. They mint it and they put it in the bank. Can the bank run uh, out of gold? It's a lot more difficult now because you have so much coins in the bank. That's the idea people need to get in their mind. It's the same thing. M0, you have tons of gold all of a sudden, and people say, oh, you're going to run out of gold. Well, we multiplied the monetary base by 12 times since 2008. So it's basically imagine that the number of gold coins in the 19th century bank is like to the moon now. So, okay, here, you want to you wanna deposit, you want to pull out your money? Okay, here, I got coins, I got coins, I got coins. All right. Uh, so, but deposit uh, runs can go really crazy. So you, you never know. It's not like uh, you are really uh, that uh, in the problem to the right. But if people go really nuts, you don't know where it stops. So they did the backstopping of the of the deposits. Um, but if you backstop all deposits, you should do it now instead of letting the big banks accumulate deposits. Uh, it, it would stop the uh, regional banks uh, flow out uh, because in practice, how do you, that's what is bad because you, uh, you, you have backstopped the deposit of SVB and, and, and Signature. And in practice, how do you come back? And Ryan is right. How do you be able to come back to say, now the, other, the future runs now, we're not backstopping deposit. So why, what about saying it implicitly instead of uh, implicitly, and this way you don't have the uh, regional banks and the big banks are saying, no, no, don't say it ex explicitly. I want a deposit from the regional banks. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So do you think they will come out and say it explicitly? I don't think so, but I think they were con uh, by the big banks in doing something which is implicitly, you won't be able to come back, but since it's not explicit, in the meantime, let's get the, the deposit and the clients from the small bank. So you, you know? think it was a con job? Or an opportunistic, I don't know why an opportunistic you, yeah, situation uh, that ultimately I, I, I mean, favors what, what the banks, tier one. How, how, do you, how do you come back and say for the next uh, run? You say, ah, no, I know, you know, it was just signature and just SVB because we're friends, but you, we don't uh, backstop your deposit. So if you do it implicitly, do it explicitly, this way the small banks don't have runs, right? That's where I say, mm, I'm not saying it's so common, but I'm saying that smells a bit bizarre. Okay. okay. So conspiracy uh, theories aside, because we do have th this right now implicit backstop bailout, um, there is a consequence right now, despite this deposit run to the tier one banks, those banks are still falling precipitously. They still haven't stopped going down. I'm talking tier one, the JP Morgan's on the right, on the rest. So at what point... Um, I know we're talking tactically and tradable, but at what point does that calm down that the clear advantage of big banks has? Uh, I, I, you know, the thing is that if you want to mo prices. model, if you want to model irrational behavior, it's hard, okay? Uh, <laughs> because it's irrational. But uh, when you look at the deposit, I mean, I, you know, you have so many people who are like, oh, we have a great crisis, we have a great crisis, we have a great crisis. That and some people which are doing swings, they hey, this duration problem is impending. Oh, is it impending? Uh, a crisis for everybody. That and then people were so shell shocked into the night that people go oh, uh, with their head. Uh, it's it's muscle memory. We, we're freaked out. So, yeah. what is the impact? Kind of, I don't know what your next slide is, but we need to talk about treasuries. Um, impact. yes, we're going to talk about treasuries. So, yes, what please. they did is something which is uh, stopping the bear raids normally, 
but it's not explicit guarantee for the average person that doesn't understand what's going on. That if you would say, uh, okay, don't worry, the deposit are all, all, all uh, guaranteed. Uh, they would be the average lambda, uh, uh, Joe it would, would, would stop doing what he's doing, okay? So what they did with MBS and treasuries, they provided a facility that I thought that it was something which was a liquidity. It's not, all right? Uh, it's not liquidity. So what they say is that you can pledge your mortgage-backed securities and treasuries at par and get a line of, of uh, liquidity against it. It's not, it's, there are two things to consider. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna do, go too much in that chart unless someone is asking that later, how this work and we compare to an BTFP is it's not looking, for, it's not going forward. So in other words, you can't buy new treasuries and say, hey, let's play, just buy it. I don't know, 85 cents on the dollar, let's pledge at 100, you can't do that. So it's, it's not uh, forward looking. It's only the stuff you had before. And the second thing is the rate is a swap plus 10 basis points. So it's not cheap because right now the cost of funding will come to that. It's not the Fed fund rates when you have a lot of reserves. A bank that has tons of coins can just lend the coins and that cost is really what they pay on the deposit and it's really low. And it's really lagging. That's why we're going to see that rising interest rates is a gift to the banks uh, initially. And people say, whoa, how is it a gift? And we're, we're going to get that. We'll get that on the, yeah, on the, the, yeah, on the, on the cost out. of deposit. So yeah. cost of deposit is at 35 basis points right now. Um, we had a precedent of mismatch of uh, assets and liabilities, which were the um, uh, saving and loans. At the end of the 70s, rates rose a lot, and same story, uh, the mortgage were underwater. What happened is they were given uh, forbearance, and then they went go for broke. And what's go for broke is recklessness. We might have still this problem down the road. Even though this line is not really a liquidity a line, uh, and it's not renewed. So do we really have forbearance? I don't know, it's 12 a month. I think it's really, backstop against the uh, speculators. This not a really liquidity that they're going to use because it's too expensive. It's mm -hmm. just to tell speculators, you know, you do your stuff because some guy has said it's an impending problem for all banks, whereas you know now that as, as uh, Silicon Valley Bank was really particular, but let's put some fuel in the fire and do some swing trades. I see some analysts which are telling on one hand, this is terrible and are buying uh, <laughs> local banks. I will not cite anyone, but you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Uh, because, and this is too, I think this facility is too expensive to be used, but it's a backstop for, for bear raiders. Say, you know what? You want to force us to uh, realize a loss on treasuries? We can pledge it for a year at par. So you want us to wait for a year now? You speculator trying to do a bear raid? Go away. That, I really think that was the the, uh, the, the intent. Uh, the intent. So I'm not sure we're going to have the go for broke. Depends if the forbearance, because we had the same situation with the uh, SNL loans, which were underwater after they're raising the rates in the 70s. If the if the forbearance continues next year, it's actually a go for broke strategy that was used by the SNL. Go for broke was they were underwater, so say we're we are underwater. It's not our cost anyway, so let's go reckless. Uh, and best case scenario, we're going to make some profits on some risky loans and we get out of uh, being underwater. All right, this is a link that I provided in this presentation. You can look at the details of this go for broke of the SNL. But we're not there yet. Right now, it really looks like a backstop prevent the bear raiders to go down to uh, go on the um, on them. Before you get so, here, though, but there's still um, you know, a category of bank that's at risk, small, medium size. There's still issues around, like you just said, the the the, the high costs of deposit, but also um, the capital raise. I mean, as if if the Fed continues to to hike, it makes it more expensive. Um, it, it, this has got to be a con consideration as it relates to what person 
what are the probabilities of default in a segment of the banking uh, right. category? Have you done any? Yeah, kind of yeah. Well, the thing is that percentage something. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. What's go really going on with those banks if they really have this uh, this problem? Um, so let me just see. Uh, As you like, I didn't want to interrupt. I just don't want to forget that because that's definitely something where um, there are many, of course, that want to swoop in and, and get some really great fire sales. And uh, trying to pick out which ones are actually going to survive is, is now foremost on some, the minds of some, like First Republic. The, the, the reality is the cost of deposit before this run uh, for the small banks was really low. It was lagging. It was basically the uh, raising rates was not working. Uh, to, to constrain the, the banks. Why? Because you have two, and I'll probably jump, and we, if I already say stuff that I'm going to, to uh, present, in the, we'll pass them because I already explained it. When you have, inter you have two sources of liquidity. You have uh, the four bank, right? You have the, the uh, reserves, okay? Or internal banking. And if your reserves are not sufficient, you're going to, to, to fit into the liquidity requirements of the Fed, you need to borrow into the interbanking uh, to get the liquidity, mm -hmm. All right? Now, when you have tons of, the, of, of, of uh, reserves, what do you do? Just lend the coins. Yeah, as a, if you're re-imagining this, because M0 is, can be a computer, M0, it's a token or a gold token. If you're a bank in Nevada and uh, you have someone coming with tons of gold in the mid 19th century, or California, uh, and does deposit. Do you need liquidity to call another bank from uh, another uh, town and say, hey, can you borrow, can I lend from you because I need some liquidity to fund some, uh, some new loans? You don't. All right. So that's why the deposits were still last month at 35 basis points, effect fund rates. But if you're lacking liquidity, you're, you're directly impacted by the Fed fund rates. Okay, and in the FDIC, the, um, the chairman was very clear and said, we are lagging Fed fund rates a lot on the cost of deposit. That was the reality. Now, with this run, is it going to change? We're going to see it. You have the, 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 the data every, every month on the FDIC. We're going to have to check that. But the reality was that the banks were paying peanuts on the deposits. Why? Because it's floated. And people take time to go and put them uh, money in the money market. They uh, try to find out other options. And, and that's react... been a trend that's been in place since like September. I started writing about it. But in particular, the, the numbers are staggering as far as deposit outflows into T-bills and money markets. So it's already been uh, that preceded this crisis. Yeah. yeah, but it has not impacted the deposit rates as per February right. still, because so much coins, so much reserve. Tim you agrees, know, he sees like the biggest risk in his opinion as well, the banking world is his wheelhouse is definitely liquidity, not so uh, as much increased cost of capital or shrinking them. So a little bit more on this liquidity, like when does it get uh, really impactful? Well, that's that's what, uh, uh, when because when I, I was telling a lot of people, a lot of entities, oh, we have a recession now, 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 we now. Have what? The, recession? Yeah, a lot of people since September were saying, recession now, recession now, recession mm -hmm. now, and it was not coming. And what they were missing is that they were thinking 2000, 2008, when reserves are poor and you have to get the liquidity on interbanking, and then you raise rates on Fed fund rates, and it directly impacts the cost of funding of banks. As of 15 days ago, the net interest margin of banks was increasing. Increasing, not decreasing. We're going to see that. Um, so you multiply the number of, of uh, the liquidity by 12 times. That's really what M0 is. Uh, okay. Uh, you need a lot of bank runs. Uh, okay. So why, how did we go from, and then we're going to come back to that. How do we go from a bull bond market to, uh, uh, into a bear market? We have a feedback loop phenomenon. Um, a lot of people thought that we were in deflation up until 2021. We were until not. Until 2000 what? 
2021. 21. Right? Okay. Yeah. A lot of people were thinking, look, the rates are low. That means that we are in deflation. Not really. Uh, and uh, it, it has symptoms of deflation because when you lower rates, you make the cost of capital of increasing a new facility cheaper. So because the, the, as Fulaton said, one of the banking school writers said, the highest cost of business is uh, interest rates. So you lower interest rates and now the new capital, the new cost of funding a new facility is cheaper than before. And then the price is full and you're like, nah, it's not really... Uh, interesting. So you have some sort of, and the other thing that looks like deflation is like the financial assets to GDP rise with falling rates, financial assets to GDP rise. The relative value of basic commodities is smaller to the total financial assets. Okay, because you leverage, and we're going to see that. Sounds a little bit foreign. We're going to see that. Or deleveraging make basic consumption more expensive to the other stuff. We're going to see that. So it, there's a feedback loop. So uh, you lower the rates and, and people say the new capacity is cheaper and look at all those financial assets. You still consume this amount of commodities and in uh, relation to financial assets that are growing, this stuff, the ratio is actually shrinking. The relative value of financial assets to a basic commodities consumption shrinks. It's like so, when you... Go ahead. When you change the direction of, of uh, interest rates, then it goes into reserve, uh, reverse and you go into deleveraging. Mm -hmm. This stuff that we've seen, this chart that I was picking and then was going down. Where is it? This thing, deleveraging. Okay. Now, why are we going to deleveraging? Well, raise uh, the rates have risen. So, what happened with uh, bonds value? Fall, fell from two thousand twenty one. Historically, same thing, right? And uh, GDP, financial assets to GDP, GDP is where is it? Uh, GDP is goods and services and zero duration assets like uh, the stuff you buy and sell in the economy. That has gone up. So the ratio of financial assets go down and GDP goes up. So the ratio is shrinking. But we have a long way to go. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good right? <laughs> as your voice trails off. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> but timing, but timing matters, right? So yeah, right now, we already into it because it's it, it is a feedback loop. Okay. So where do we go from here? We're in a bear market for bonds. We have been, in my estimation. Um, not just the top of August 2020, but confirmed in April of 2022. We've also been in the yield curve inversion for better part of a, a year. Um, you've talked about, you know, people were talking about recession in September. I actually didn't turn recession risk on until Sunday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah. Last, if, if you have it a bank it failing, forward. it affects the psychology. And uh, a lot of banks are going to look at their risk and then they'll look at how they uh, extend loans because they create inflation. People say, no, but inflation is, oh, you know, there's more demand for oil. Or no, 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 no. The uh, uh, inflation uh, doesn't come from demand or, or whatever. If this is a price rise, when you have a temporary mismatch of demand supply, it's a price rise. But we have so many prices going up Okay, uh, at the supermarket, that's not demand mm. supply. This is a monetary phenomenon, All right? So when you have negative duration, you want a negative duration portfolio. How do you build a negative duration portfolio? Well, personally, I was short the treasury since February, 2021. Uh, well, you see, this is negative duration. If you had some commodities at the time, you also benefit because those have zero duration. They're not did they're you present have commodities, group. did you say at the time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, because they have zero duration. They are they're not future cash flow discounted to today. Their mm -hmm. value doesn't depend on the future. All right. Zero duration is things over Things over All right. Things okay. over <laughs> All right. So now let's discuss very quickly why but in this... a recession. We need to talk about that though. Treasuries holdings in a recession, the the rumor of and then confirmation of. 
what's your philosophy and and i i don't i think that you're going to see the treasury's yield uh could potentially uh fall okay uh, and the bonds uh, move up a bit uh but the excess of money and the stagflation uh, debt crisis will come back because of this quantity of money that makes its way into did you and just to clarify what you said just um you said liquidity and what was the other one um, stagflation oh yeah stagflation we're going to have that for a long stagflation debt crisis we're going to have that for a long time because we're not in a debt deflation situation where you have a tiny bit of monetary base and you have tons of debt and it has a tendency to plunge like 2008. We have tons of money that was doing nothing. And all of a sudden you raise the rates and they go, oh, the banks are, oh, they are raising the, the rates. Wonderful. And you say, well, what do you mean wonderful? I'm going to show you why. The, so basically, on the origin of banking credit and uh, and what is money, bank currency credit. Let's go very fast on that. It's what's money. Initially, banking there was no banking. There was just token. It was the gold coin. This is M zero. It doesn't fail. If you bring the Spanish gold coins uh, uh, from Latin America, you expect that they're, they're going to spend at some point. There's going to be a credit crunch. No, there's no credit crunch. There's no credit. It's all M zero. Okay, just to, just to interject, you are talking about these um, tokens. I can't help but think of Bitcoin. And yeah, yeah, but those are, are the equivalent of the wood token uh, of the post-1929 crisis. They have no legal, legal tender value. Okay, they, they, are, they become interesting when uh, the whole system fails because okay. you have nothing else. But then okay, once yeah. the national currency is reestablished, wood token gone. Also, okay. uh, my yeah. system... I was going to say it's a collateral, not even collateral. It's a calamity trade. It's a crash trade. It's yes, not even, exactly. It's not even a it's collateral a, trade necessarily. Yeah. Like gold can be a collateral trade. It can be a currency. It can be a commodity. Yeah. But it, Bitcoin is just a wood token in your estimation. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, okay. also during Weimar, uh, Mrs. did a book about the, the, the studying the crisis. They were using tokens. Well, uh, the worst part of the crisis, you know, the rest was, and then reestablish national currency, and people say uh, the tokens are not used anymore. But na reestablishing national currency is out there. Like we, we have to go through the wormhole first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not okay. there yet. All uh, right. So Bitcoin's still going to be a player. It's still going to be an asset class. It's going it, uh, it, yeah, to. The be more, the more, the more, the more people say it's uh, completely unstable. Ah, uh, this is the end of the world. People say I need some tokens, but then if they wait too long, and poof, uh, there's a new uh, monetary system that is very stable, and oh, nobody wants the, the stuff. It's okay. Stable. All right. Thank you for addressing that. It just I, I had to because it, because it has been rising with dollar and gold, right? So recently, uh, as banks. Say, yeah. yeah, Powell actually pulled forward the whole recession risk last Tuesday at his presentation. That's when I actually turned like, oh, no, we're, we're, forget 50 basis point hike. <laughs> but yeah. um, as it relates to then the you know events of Sunday and, and it, it's ongoing, so, obviously dollar went higher, gold with Bitcoin, recessionary tells. Um, I didn't want to interrupt, but definitely thank you for that color on the Bitcoin because Tim also, he says he agrees with you. Um, another thing that Tim mentioned, because he's a client, but he's also like, he's my you know interpreter for what's going on in the banking world as well on a day-to-day -day basis um banks are definitely looking at the funding risks duration risk counter counterparty risk yeah. if they were doing it all along they will be fine yeah. <laughs> they did not look hard at those risks they are in crisis mode internally and yeah. right now obviously there there are um right now that's front and center with credit suisse okay that's so basically, the origin of, uh, of, uh, of means of circulation, you had initially, you had no bank, so you had only the token with the legal tender because they got the king. And if you counterfeit, the king is going to uh, kill you. So it's really, it's not just Bitcoin, it's a legal tender. There's the uh, uh, try to counterfeit a coin, uh, even if there's no, you know, the drachma coin, the, the silver coin mm -hmm. in, in, in Greece 2,200 uh, years ago. There was the king to establish the quantity and it's a good coin and you can do business with it. And I'm putting me, the king of, uh, of Greece, I'm putting my face. So if you try to counterfeit, uh, you're going to have problems. So it's legal tender. Uh, it's a token, legal tender, tender token. But why is it a, a token and the difference with bank currency? Well, you go to the, 
the banks are created, you deposit your, your coin and they give you a ticket. Like you go in a, a nightclub, they give you a ticket. Uh, it's a claim on your, uh, on your uh, coat when you get out. It's the same, same principle. And it's very practical because you don't need to transport your heavy stuff. You just uh, exchange the ticket. It's a currency. Now you have the king, which is saying, uh, okay, now in 90 days, you're going to receive uh, some uh, coins because you did a service for me. And uh, the person goes to the bank and say, hey, can you give me tickets? Because in 90 days, you're going to receive that. That's basically the banks create the tickets against the M0, the money or the credit, right? And you can even pay directly with credit in the old days, like more than 200 years ago, you just endorse and give to someone else and the person endorse and you circulate the credit as a mean of circulation. So that's how you have to understand that what the Fed did is print tons and tons and tons and tons of coins. So that's, that's, uh, that's what they did. They did expand the M0 like nuts. So you can pull and pull and pull and pull. Um, if you SVB, uh, they, they, they move very fast, but they really increase the reserve to the moon. So right. we're in this, you're going to talk about this stagflationary environment. When did we yeah. actually enter it in your estimation? I, I think we're already in it. No, I know. When do you think we entered it? Um, we entered it when in the middle of 2020, uh, what happened is that we had mega printing. And we, we're going to discuss that there are two ways to... to uh, you're always anticipating my slides. <laughs> Am I? No, I just don't want to miss what, it, like, I want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm and then we're going to move to that. This yeah. is, this is, I want to learn this stuff. Um, so what we did is, uh, I explained the, the, the situation, the bone bubble, uh, I'm coming a little backward, the bone bubble, he, uh, Thomas Took explained that they were doing the same thing uh, by issuing more notes against loan to government, uh, you reduce the interest rates, so it's not deflation that we had. It was manipulation of rates. By buying government bonds, they put down the bond, the bonds prices. All we right? all agree with you on that. We yeah. understand that concept. It was in play for a long time, but especially since 09. Okay. But then what they do is they create money capital. It's not a means of circulation. All right. There's a difference um, between that. Why we know it's not really deflation because the rates on uh, the profit on uh, of corporations is not low. Normally, if it was deflation, the corporate profits should be low. And but they have period. been de decelerating at a rapid pace, especially the uh, tech. Now, recently, place. yeah, yeah. Yes, but recently. when you remember, people say corporate profits, corporate margin to the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, during the printing, I say deflation. Normally, the the, the 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 corporation would would not have so much profits. So it's a fake. Uh, it's a fake deflation just to prop up some bad assets. And to stuff the and to repress the rates on the government bonds. Um, all right, uh, money capital and means of circulation. Mean money capital is the following: you print a lot of money, it sits in the banks. It's the same thing as you give tokens to a casino in uh, Las Vegas. You know, you can have trillions. They play uh, with in the casino in the stock market a bit, uh, but it doesn't mean that your uh, casino token can be spent to buy a sandwich. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you don't have inflation in the real economy. So people still look at, oh, M2 is increasing, and then there is a M M0, and we have inflation. No, 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 no. It needs to Casino be used. Casino specific. Yeah, it, it's, it needs to be used. And how do we move to stagflation? You give the money, and it goes into the uh, you, to buy the sandwich. So now uh, it goes uh, into the, the street, right? Because you did the steamy during the COVID. Second thing, the banks, when you uh, buy bonds, then net interest margin are on the floor, all right? They're not very good, all right? But then what happens to net interest margin? Um, so what happened with net interest margin? With interest rates rising. Since by raising interest rates, that's what happened to profitability of banks. So people say, now nah, we raise rates, the banks are still, no, 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 because the, the deposit cost was lagging badly. The lending rates were falling fed for the rates, but because they were using their coins to create new loans, it's fantastic. Hell of a time. So by raising rates, the Fed actually increased initially the velocity. And it can be seen 
by the loan growth, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. This is the, if you do the average of the loan growth in 2002, it's much higher than the average, which is probably around here. Yeah. All right? So the Fed, by raising rates, that's why reserve requirements, we were talking about, that, would have been more appropriate. So why do we have stagflation debt crisis? Is that the co cost of funding for the banks were low? So they, yeah. as I just showed, net interest margin were rising and the uh, gro loan growth was rising. Means of circulation is really, it goes into the streets. Because if you have a reserve, you don't use it. It's just good to play on Wall Street, but it doesn't create loans in the economy. Now you raise interest margin, or you raise rates, and then, oh, then we're making more money. All right? So but the cost of funding is low. So pff, they keep going. But the market rates is too high for a lot of uh, traded debt because the market rates is fed from rates. They have two rates. You have the rates for funding banks and the rates, the market rates. Okay? So but what happens? SVB has market rates on its asset, but the bank which had uh, variable rates, short-term loans or uh, factoring, <laughs> life is good in principle until you create uh, uh, a bank run. All right? Um, and then that I already explained. When you have debt deflation, you have no reserves, you are, in term banking is freezing, so you raise rates, it's immediate, you, you have no, nowhere to find liquidity. You don't have reserve and you don't have interbank. So what, go back to that last uh, slide, please. Um, reserve rates, uh, re, um, requirements. Why do you, what's your case for what they, why they should have done that over this unlimited FDIC protection, basically? Because when people say, yeah, the Japanese are stupid with uh, yield curve control. If you starve the bank and they make no money, uh, what's their, uh, they have two phenomena. By raising rates, you actually increase this price for a category of, of products and not for the other. And I think I have, I, I don't know if I passed that slide. Maybe I passed that slide. Oh, yeah, this, this slide. We, yeah, since you're asking questions, I have to jump. Uh, uh, right. but, so when you raise rates, what happens is that the cost of funding the supermarket inventory goes up, right? Okay. So, but the demand is inelastic. Okay. And since the demand is inelastic, what you're going to continue to buy the, the groceries at a higher price, and then you have less money available for durable. That's why Kemmerer in the uh, 1913, 1920 say a one single metric to measure uh, prices is stupid because he says, uh, if he spends more on item A, B, and C, he will of necessity spend less on for article D, E, and F, right? Makes sense. So when you measure inflation on durables, give me just one second, I need to do something. <laughs> Jeffrey's getting the hook. <laughs> You're wonderful to stick around. We're after the power hour, but I'm I'm fascinated. So, you know, if you have questions along the way for Jeffrey, pop into chat or um QA. Happy to relay it, but I, I don't want to, no. you know, <laughs> slow down the, the, the flow. You want to do your presentation directly, like as you anticipated. I don't want to get you off. No, it's, it's fine. So basically what people do say, hey, we have deflation, look at durables. Uh, no. If the durables fall, it's because you're, you're only measuring that you have a lot of inflation on the inelastic demand. All right? So people say, hey, we have deflation. No, 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 no. Not true. Um, so let me just go in this Maslow scale. So the interest rates and commodities, this is very interesting. And what, there are a lot of people who follow copper and interest rate and interest. They say, oh, there's a, there's a magic link between the two. No, there's no magic link between the two. Thomas Tuck, who was the genius of 19th century commodities, explained the relationship. It should be incumbent that there is um, a, a relationship between return in money and return in kind. In other words, if the money is not able anymore, is falling against commodities, uh, people say, hey, give me rates because I need to be compensated for the vagaries of the currency. That's his words. So basically when, that's why uh, a currency cannot plunge against commodities and, ra and, and rates not rise on the long bonds unless you do QE, all 
right? So if you don't do QE and commodities go up in price, you're going to see long bond prices uh, uh, go down and interest rate on long bond go up. And that's why the, if you try to track copper and, and uh, 10 years, it's like, oh, they, they move in tandem. It's Thomas Took, uh, Chair of Statistics and Commodity uh, Statistics at Oxford 19th century that explains that perfectly. All right. but, we're, but we're facing a whole bunch more QE from this bank bailout and whatever happens next. So going yeah, back I don't to- know. We don't have QE yet. And these facilities are having a cost which is higher than the current deposit rates. So this is really a trick announcement so that people don't go buried. Now, if they prolong that after 12 months, 24, uh, 36 months, we, it looks like forbearance, uh, uh, saving and loan style. And then they go for broke and then they go completely uh, uh, crazy. So, so, the we have a, so we have a year maybe before more, like what's your timing on this? I know you can't project with the, you know, the next QE round, but we have this quasi fiscal deficit. We have still- I mean, um, doing QE with a quasi fiscal deficit, is this, it would be like just madness. I mean, this is uh, quite a fiscal deficit. There's already a central bank that leaks. It leaks. It has. It is having losses, and it's uh, basically have to print money to try to sterilize the money, which is uh, it's like a, a death spiral. So this is a death spiral for a central bank. Normally, there are fixes. There are situations where where you can't fix that. You can fix this quasi fiscal deficit, but it's really not looking good. Now, the it's, not, skin, it's not without pain, it, it, obviously, and, a, and a, a, I hate to use the word, but a reset. So, okay, so continue with this. We'll, we'll talk about you know, impacts right. another time. But um, right, my, my, my Maslow scale is the following is that basically with leverage, you buy a, without leverage, you buy food. That's the stuff you buy anyway. You have access to cheap credit. Hey, I'm going to buy an iPhone, iPhone app to lose weight. Or at the same time, that makes sense. But anyway, when you deleverage, you can't buy your, uh, you're going to sell everything until you can buy food because you need to survive. That's why if you had, we were coming back to Stone Age, everything would, would go into food and energy, your iPhone app would go to zero. And that's why measuring the durable goods as a, as a say this is inflation it's not it makes no sense all right Moving um on. Mm -hmm. all right so uh debt stuffing and and speculation uh he's saying uh thomas took 1826 because there's been uh low rates people are being speculating uh because of the war currency financing uh, McCulloch, 1877, he said, hey, because of this uh, redundant currency and very low rates, that uh, repression of rates by war financing, uh, they, we just have people and we were lending only to people which are bullying and bearing stocks. Does it sound familiar? Mm. Uh, 1920, the thrifty people have been uh, hurt and then the low rates uh, have get, led to dangerous speculation and shameless extravagance and the newly rich, whereas the uh, savers have been hurt. Rinse, repeat. The way out, if you want to do a way out, there was a contraction after the war, uh, Napoleonic War, and say, oh, you're going to get rid of the bad credit. And that was very painful. <laughs> McCulloch. <laughs> and and McCulloch, okay. McCulloch said, fortunately, the, for the country, our present, now present, it is harmony man. And uh, the, his uh, head of the treasury is also a harmony man. And they did a contraction. Very painful. It's not because price fall that it's good. It's because they remove the, uh, the greenbacks. Then you have the real rates. And it did the real rates, uh, independent from the bank, is fantastic at allocating resources. And as a result, the US post-Civil War in 1913 had the highest growth in its history. So we need uh, in the US someone exceptional politically to say enough. And I uh, refer you to Gulak, who said, uh, you got to do something about entitlement. I refer you to, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, you got to do something about what? About, uh, about war, spend, war spending and entitlement and, and okay. budget. And yeah. you had the same talk from uh, Miller. 
So if we could have someone with political courage, I don't know if we're going to move the, the uh, government bonds from the system. If it were that, you would say boom, the economy would, uh, would uh, move by leaps and bounds. It's a pipe dream, but that's what was done in the past, and it worked to wonder. We can done. Okay, not not without impact. Okay, continue. This is we're we're getting into some potential solutions, but they're very painful and far off, and require a regime change as it relates to our political structure. I mean, political um, everything. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So th this is fascinating. I mean, there's no lack of, um, you know, knowledge gained in going back in history and trying to figure out the precedents, um, you know, history rhymes and all that. But also it is really repeat, rinse and repeat. And here we are again. So and many don't trade on, you know, a, that kind of time frame. Um, that is the biggest issue, right? So we're really trying to, to deal with the crisis in hand and how it's going to impact um, equity and, and bond prices. I'm with you. I think that we could have, you know, an uh, increase in bond prices, but it's just going to hit the underside of that, uh, you know, 40 year uh, trend line in bonds and then reverse lower. So yeah. it's really just a swing long. If it gets going, it's yeah. really more of a recession tell, and then it will re reverse and come down hard again. Yeah. So dollar, gold, um, and obviously bonds are right now the the and for some related speculative liquidity reason, Bitcoin too temporarily. But I still don't. That, that's not my thing. That's not my jam. What is your position um, on the impact, all of this fabulous historical reference on gold, uh, gold and silver specifically, and not miners because they really do uh, effectively trade with the direction of the stock market. So as it relates to gold and silver, physical I'm a, I'm, and paper. I'm a, I'm a phone, I'm a silver. Uh, it's very difficult to trade. And that's why it's very interesting. But silver is a very interesting asset uh, that I've sold for many years. And there were some statistics in 17th century that showed that food, wheat uh, versus uh, silver over one century moves by 0.5% in the UK. One century, not per year. You have swings. Yeah, but over... that's where so, money goes to die. <laughs> it's like so you have, you, you, no, but it, 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 it means that it, uh, it's a monetary illusion. It's just uh, the currency that goes down. And the silver going up is, uh, doesn't go up. It goes nowhere. It's just the currency it keeps going down and down and down and down. Right? So <clears throat> what I'm trying to say with, with silver is that it typically, uh, what we have, we have treasuries with a stagflation phase and then, oh, a debt crisis, stagflation, debt crisis, stagflation, debt crisis. During this, the uh, overheating, and people will say, oh, the rates are going to go up, they're going to go up, they're going to go up, uh, the silver uh, goes down. So it went down in September um, last year, uh, October, because people say, oh, you know, we have to raise it. But then it creates a problem with the treasury. Okay? And you remember Yellen saying, oh, illiquid. And mm -hmm. then people say, oh, this is a problem, and this and that, and then... So you, you, the, the people believed in disinflation and believed in disinflation, woof, silver goes up. That was exactly October 11th, by the way, when Treasury uh, Yellen, Secretary Yellen came out and talked yeah. about the, uh, the, the illiquid Treasury market and how they would work yeah. on that. And then the next day, October 12th, um, 21st, excuse me, I was going to say that was the 12th. And then the 21st, Bank of Japan came in with a, um, its second massive yen intervention. So there, there is coordinated intervention that does come in, right, and triggers this inflationary impulse, both in stocks and bonds and, and the rest. Um, when do you think the next, I know this is hard to uh, kind of anticipate, but they've been so popular. When's our next intervention move so we can time that and trade that? Okay. Uh, I think at this point, it's not totally, totally bad for the Fed. Yeah, not bad for what? For the Fed. Oh, for the Fed. Okay. Yeah, because they couldn't stop this uh, this velocity. Remember, because before the bank died, 
uh, they will say, oh, we're going to go to 6%. And then the, when people, we have this acceleration of velocity, and then you have a crunch, uh, and then the rates go down, silver goes up, and then acceleration of velocity, uh, rates go up, because it's uh, uh, currency is two things. Flow of funds, that's the old name for uh, capital flows, uh, mm -hmm. in the, uh, explained by Henry Thornton uh, 200 years ago, and then the uh, trade. So basically what happens is that you know, acceleration, people expect short-term rates to go rise, and then they basically this flow of fund uh, is not good for silver prices, okay? And then what happens, it goes too far, and then the treasury gets into problem. We got the same thing. We got treasury problem, and then woof, silver goes up again. Yes, right? very much so. Absolutely. Right. It, yen and dollar and gold. Right. So, and stock, so when you see, when I see, yeah. when I see that uh, uh, silver start to stop, I say, oh, oh, I'm going to show the treasuries again because we're going to have a next phase of acceleration. Okay, so that's your uh, correlated tell, silver uh, and treasuries. Yeah, uh, they, they move in, in opposite because all of a sudden you have to admit that you can't raise rates because otherwise the clearance are going to go AWOL. So the if, currency if what's going to go more. AWOL? Currency. Currency. The, the treasur you... treasuries. Okay. But right now we have two things going on which are opposite. Some people think it's a debt crisis, a, a credit crisis, and say, oh, we have a shortage of dollars. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the rates, the flow of funds uh, is less going in. I'm not buying the shortage of dollar yet. I want to see the uptick in the banking, in the FDIC say, oh, you know, we are really, we had 12 times more coins reserves. You saw the ratio, you saw the coverage. Mm -hmm. yep. But now we still, we have to be catch. At that point, I would change my tune. That's a dollar and nothing else if that happens. But there's so much reserves that I'm thinking, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Poza said it's what, you know. <clears throat> right now, so you ask me, when is the next phase? No, what would, what would happen to the dollar right there? What's, what's, that's the tell. Well, well if you have a jump in, uh, a jump in uh, cost of deposit in banking, like FDIC say, oh, we were at 35 bips. Hey, we are a uh, 2%. Uh oh, uh, if you are not long the dollar yet, you have a problem. You have a really a shrinkage, a shortage of dollar because now the, the, the banking system was gushing dollars. That's why a lot of DXY people have been completely flat footed since uh, October. Say, oh, you know, the Credit Suisse is going to be terrible. Uh uh. The, mean, the NIM were expanding, the loans were expanding very fast. This is pushing the, the US banking system, was pushing dollar. And that's why the DXY was going down, all right? Now, if the deposit rates like jump like crazy, mm -hmm, that means mm -hmm. the banking system is like, is like I'm doing the opposite. And then if you're short the dollar, in you're, 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 you're in trouble. You're in trouble. All right, so that, that's definitely a tell that um, capital raises, deposit rate competition um, as, a, as a trigger, a, a higher dollar, but you're still, I don't want to say skirting the issue of recession. You already kind of attacked. Yeah, I think I think that right you now we have a slower, question. slower, slower. We have a slower velocity. I can't mm -hmm. see how the velocity increases because the bankers they're gonna look at the bank which is down and then they're gonna review. Oh, uh, the, what do we do? We have one year. What's our duration? Uh, mm -hmm. Are they gonna extend that? They're going they're gonna be cautious. And that yes. alone should slow down the velocity. Yes. Okay. okay. So that actually is helping the Fed, but not helping the economy at loan, at loan contraction. Definitely mm. not happy, helping um, equity prices. And it's a short term long in bonds. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a short term because uh, the underlying trend is like we have printed, uh, we have, we've done, you know, generally we multiply by four times. The, uh, the 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 uh, monetary base three four times, uh, and uh, the uh, price, and then the, you had the boom in stocks first, bonds first, and then crash in currency. All right, uh, <clears throat> what happens in during the civil war? Uh, I think I have the data. I will put it in the presentation of how much they printed and how much uh, eventually it comes into the circulation. It took sixteen years between the massive printing of Spanish gold to enter the circulation. During the, uh, the uh, revolution, 1791 in France, they did massive increase in, in, uh, in Manda Asinia, okay? And it took, it took time, a lot of time, 
uh, two years before we got into real uh, inflation. So a lot of people say, you oh, know, we can print money, it doesn't create inflation. We got today what we've been uh, doing since the 2010. It's starting today. So what the long-term trend, unless you have McCulloch uh, 2.0 21st century, uh, the treasury goes, we're gonna stop this, uh, this madness and we're gonna, we need some uh, currency that looks like a currency. Uh, this is the trend long term. But for now, I'd say bull market, uh, uh, no, uh, normally. But, and if people say, oh, we have uh, credit uh, deflation, I say, unless you believe that the treasury is a credit risk, because that's what created the loss for us as SVB, it's first the duration. We have too much debt. So we could have some uh, some banks going down. Is it going to be the, the cr a credit uh, deflation like 2008 or 1929? I doubt so. So I have a different opinion on that. And I hate to, you know, uh, differ with Professor, <laughs> but I actually do see a deflation impulse both in yields and commodities um, and a equity. bit. You're going to see that because we slow down. But you've seen the prices in 2009. You remember the chart I showed you that we had uh, the maximum we had in price, uh, retail price fall, and the green, and, oops, sorry about that, and the green price spikes that we don't have anymore. Yes, 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 yes. But that's still the artificial inflation that's, that's holding it up. I remember that. So, um, I, I, and then we do not have reserve. We have so much reserve. Right now, the Fed is still paying banks so that they don't land on uh, reverse repo. They're still paying banks so that they don't land. I have to still, on my intermarket, since I am, you know, I'm pulling from you this knowledge from the past to apply it to the present. But I, what I do use on a regular basis, even if a monthly chart you know, might not seem very historical to you. Um, I use it in my intermarket analysis and it definitely shows a deflation impulse even before, um, you know, Powell pulled it forward last week in his talk. And, and then of course the bank failures this week and, and the uh, the bailout on the weekend. But the, the, um, the definitely is a, is a reversal, let's just say from this current narrative of inflation and I'm a big oh, yeah. Janista since summer of 2020, but now I have, I, I uh, yeah, you have more, you, you, no. you have, a, you, you have a, you're going to have a slowdown in velocity for sure. Mm -hmm. But if people expect 2008, nah, no. Well, I'm still seeing a leg lower for sure um, in tech and uh, this bond. Oh yeah, no, I'm short tech short. personally. I'm short tech. Okay. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm short tech. Uh, I still have some, uh, uh, some Chinese stock, uh, uh, small business lending and stuff. Uh, my commodities, I, I still think that long-term is going to be there, but I would not go long stocks or uh, bonds at the margin. You could go long. I would not go long uh, uh, stocks whatsoever right now. Uh, that we, are, we fully agree. All right. So just to kind of wrap this up, because we had um, a, a fabulous uh, trip down memory lane here as it relates to <laughs> the risks um, of what the the market right now is facing in stagflation um, and also bankruptcies. There's no question, at least, that there's going to be some bankruptcy. taking oh, yeah. of, the, of the tree here in, in, in banking, but th this collateral damage, of course, we could still, I still see a credit event this year, um, crisis, credit crisis event that's triggering volatility. But you have a lot of what I'm really surprised about is junk bumper. bonds. I get it. Junk bonds. What, why are the junk, what I see is market debt is going to crunch. Uh, and junk bonds and companies which have been relying on the junk bonds, those guys are going to suffer. Yes. Uh, and I see that is going to be slowing down things, of course. Uh, but you, re you remember at the peak of the cycle of 2008, we have the economy is not like crazy. And we got at 8%. In the top of the, of the cycle, we didn't have this level of inflation in 2008, remember? Mm -hmm. So what I can see is that even if we go into uh, a recession, uh, prices still, give you an example. Uh, Argentina, they have a, a recession. They are, oh, 
the inflation rate instead of being 100% is like, oh, 95. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is that you have a lot of, of recession where the price is still, and, and I've, I've been living in Latin America for a long time, you still, you have a recession and prices still go up to 3%. You know? Well, that's the, that's the risk that we have right before us, which is navigating, I, not in Argentina, but um, a, a similar less, Yeah, a situation where when the economy is peaking, you have eight, and when it's bottoming, you, uh, you have negative real GDP by two, and you still have two, 3% inflation. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Um, we definitely already had some, some questions and comments that came in. I wanted to also kind of allow this, this chance to show a very cool technology. I mean, you have done your, you know, your banking and risk arbitrage. Um, was it York Asset Management? You were there for about 15 years. And, yeah, um, yeah, York Asset Management, yeah. And then you went years. into basically, you know, a software uh, mode of creating yeah. a, um, a very cool tool that I want to also uh, show. So let's show. Uh, let's so let's do that now. And then and then I want to just do again it. thank you again for all for the prepared presentation and um, it, it, very very good parallels right to where we are now. I know you think longer term, but yeah. it's fascinating to me because it it, it it absolutely times and my clients know this. With my you know bonds are done going up in August 2020. Uh, things over paper since summer of 2020. Um, mm -hmm. The oil as an inflation hedge that petered out back back in November of 2022. But the point is, this has been um, underperformance of tech uh, that I called in November of 2021, and I still see another leg lower. People think I'm crazy. This is this is what I see, and so I'm I'm looking at this, um, and we're kind of even on a short term basis looking at this, uh, you know, this relative long in bonds underperformance in tech. So even with your perspective, which is so much different, we're arriving at the same place. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I, and we talk about the dollar, we talk about gold and silver. Um, I, I'm very appreciative of this because your, your intellectual um, and very educational view on how history repeats is applicable absolutely uh, to an investing and in tra trading time frame right here and right now uh, and then of course you're not hyper um hyperbolic about this drama within the bank crisis you're just saying we're in a bad place you said <laughs> yeah yes. I mean, the banks practical. have been uh, <laughs> they have been uh, failing for uh, in the last 300 years every, every the next morning the sun is still rising every, yes but 50 percent of new but but 50 percent of new um brokerage accounts that have been open since covid by the way, uh, uh, are not at all thinking about the 300 years that we have been failing. So, <laughs> and hopefully some of the uh, the newer traders in our Discord product, it's a community uh, literally of newer, younger traders, they'll watch this and learn. Um, and then of course I have uh, for, you know, my club membership, which is more intermediate, um, savvy retail and boutique investment um, managers, but then the edge a product which is very much focused on money management. This is what I was originally going to have exclusive for them, right? They're more position traders and the like. I decided to open it up, even though this is advanced. I mean, your yeah, concept- But it, with the history uh, perspective, it, it's more interesting. People yes, do parallel thank and, you. And, yeah. But you pulled it forward to modern day and yeah. I'm very appreciative of that. Okay, so let's let's segue into a review of your very cool graphical visual software. Yeah. Um, and folks can learn more about you, by the way, at Graph Financials on Twitter. And yes. then of course- um, your uh, DocuTalk software. So go ahead. So, so this is why uh, what's going on is like in November of uh, last year, Elon Musk said, hey, I want to uh, have reduced meetings. But how, how do you do that if you have a technical product to discuss? Uh, normally, you're going to have, you have to use three apps. You're going to have to use an app, which is uh, a video on mobile, but it's not readable. Okay, the, the, the document, the presentation of the document is not readable on mobile, it's too small. And besides, you can't flip through a video, right? So you're going to have to send no. a document separately. Mm -hmm. uh, you send a document, there's nobody to explain. Uh, so there's a bit of a problem. And then you want to reply, you use text messaging uh, or uh, voice messaging, but you don't have the context. So this software 
is 30 times more readable than a video on mobile, but it switched to a document on post, and then you can reply. All right, let's see what, what I mean. Mm -hmm. All right. So here you got something you're going to say, well, it's just a video, right? All right. It's the North American Association. Uh, uh, can you hear the uh, Ken talking? Or? I can't no? hear Ken talking. So basically, uh, mm -hmm. he's going to go through the uh, presentation. He's going to do some scrolling. He's going to present. All right. I'm going to pose. When you pose a video on YouTube, what do you have? A frozen image, right? Mm -hmm. I pose, right? It's not frozen. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then if I let the virtual presenter control my document, it's going to move the document. I'm not moving the document. It's moving my document on my screen and uh, doing stuff live. But if I stop him, I can read alone. So basically, I don't need to send two archives, a video and a document. It's both. You can use for both formats. That's Excellent. the U.S. patented technology. Now I can reply. How do I reply? Well, I just do this. I'm going to block my, uh, my video, otherwise it's not going to work. I can jump in the box while the document is still open in the background. Okay? And reply to the presenter who's... Yeah, no, I'm the one. This is still... Uh, I'm going to remove the notation. Now I'm the one presenting with the same doc live document in the background. And now I'm here, I pulled cool. in the box while the live document was still open in the background. So imagine the speed you gain when you have a technical document, a presentation, a balance sheet, a macro uh, presentation. You can even charge more for people who respond. So for example, if you have clients that at your uh, uh, Laduc trading and they want to ask questions, you charge them more, but they, they're happy. They don't have to write a long question. And then they do, they do the highlights, they take their turn, they do highlights, they press stop and they get the link, blah, 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 save. And send. So it's basically the equivalent of a WhatsApp audio, except it's visual inside a live document. I would love this inside Slack. That's our client workspace where- And then people, you send yeah. that, you have you have a balance sheet, the person jumping the box, answers back and forth and back and forth. And it's always crisp. And it works because people open uh, their presentation on mobile. We made it 30 times more readable than a video on mobile. That's All important right? since so much All takes right. place on okay. mobile. This is all right. So you're going to see, you're going to go like, what? I said it's 30 times more precise than sending the presentation or a video presentation on, well, this is YouTube, eh? not me. <laughs> the, the, the delay is due to YouTube presentation. Yes. They won't... Yeah. All right. This is on mobile. This is used for technical documents, engineering documents. You can move. You can move the guy, me, around. Mm -hmm. uh, this is YouTube. Move around. That's all right. All right? So you say, well, you're saying it's 30 times more readable. You're kidding me. Now, making an annotation, changing pace. Document. I can oh, increase very the size. Granular. I see. Yep. Zoom, so, zoom, zoom, zoom. Video for, to show a document. No thanks. This is old technology. Now, you want to see that with Loom, which is so popular? Let's have some fun. <laughs> all right, Loom. Same uh, with older video tech, Loom. What do you do? Can you read something? You can't move anything. Mm -hmm. This is the same document. It's a Loom recording, same page. All right, so upgrade. If you have documents, presentation, legal contracts, any document you want to discuss Excellent. with precision, speed, two ways, readable, any device, no install, seven clicks. This is DocuTalk. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, this is <laughs> renaissance, right? You've got the old <laughs> with the very, very new. And 
um, hot product. So congratulations on that. And thank you so much, Jeffrey, for coming in and doing this presentation. Um, I actually thought we were just going to kind of chit chat. You have prepared slides. You are so prepared. Um, and that makes the education even more heightened and tradable. So I want to thank you again for um, for doing this macro to micro power hour, which went a little bit long, but it was so worth it. Um, and I'm glad it was uh, interesting. I hope people liked it. I'm going to put this up on our YouTube channel. Um, again, you can find Jeffrey at uh, Graph Financials on Twitter um, and DocuTalk. And Samantha LaDuke from LaDuke Trading, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And uh, I'll be back in two weeks with Craig um, for our next Macro to Micro Power Hour. Uh, everyone have a great rest of the trading week. Thanks again. Madame LaDuke, merci beaucoup. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.